Um, as you are able, would you please remain standing for the reading of the word, which today will be done by one of our high school students, Naya Morong. So today we will be reading out of Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarah, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran and set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev, the word of the Lord. Be to God. Maybe seated. Well, today we are wrapping up our Genesis series in the beginning where we are just covering the first parts of the first 12 chapters of the book of Genesis, which means that next week we are kicking off a new series going to be called The Passion Week. We are going to be spending four weeks focusing our hearts and our minds on some of the things that Jesus did in the last week of Jesus' life leading up to the cross. And so uh, we are excited to dive into that together as a church in, in terms of the Sunday sermons. But we also are very excited to offer you a free resource, a gift to you. Um, it is a devotional called The Passion, uh, talking about exactly that, the final days of Jesus. And so this will cover a few more of the elements of the final week of Jesus' life. Uh, so these devotionals are available to you today out in the lobby. They will also be available next Sunday. We don't start them until a week from tomorrow, a week from Monday, March. So March 13th, Monday, March 13th is the day that we start. If you get one today, no cheating, no looking ahead, uh, no skipping and trying to start early, okay? We're going to do this together. We're going to prepare our hearts. And we figured, you know, with Christmas, we always have the Advent season preparing our hearts for Christmas. And we thought, let's have an Easter Advent preparing our hearts to celebrate the resurrection, to celebrate the greatest day in history. And so um, we're going to come together corporately together uh, in worship and, and in the word, but also individually, hopefully everyone will take the opportunity to just spend a few minutes a day in God's word, uh, hearing from God what he has in store for us just as we look at that final week of Jesus' life. So um, again, grab one today or wait till next Sunday and grab one, but we would love it if you would partner with us um, in, 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 in reading these devotionals and preparing our hearts for Easter. So before we get to that, we do have one final week in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, we're diving into Genesis chapter 12. This is a really important story uh, for our understanding of the scripture, of who Christ is, of who God's people are, who we are as the church. And so we want to dive into that and get just kind of a little overview of this person named Abraham. But we want to make sure that we are, are caught up and we know where we're, we're headed together. So the book of Genesis, in addition to the other first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are written by Moses. And Moses is writing these books and giving them to the people of Israel at a very important time in their history. The nation of Israel had spent 400 years as slaves in Egypt. They've come out of Egypt. They got into the desert, headed towards the promised land because of their sin. They end up wandering the desert for 40 years. And now they are getting ready to enter the promised land. It is the land of the Canaanites. So they're getting ready to enter a land of spiritual opposition, a physical opposition. And so there's probably some, some fear that comes with that. But in this moment, Moses is trying to remind the people through these five books, hey, 
Here is who the Egyptians were and their false worship. That's not who you are. Here is who the Canaanites are and their false worship where you're going. That's not who you are either. So Moses is writing these books to remind us who we are and more importantly to remind us whose we are. And he's reminding the Israelites and he's reminding us today as well that we belong to God, the one true God. We belong to him and we are going to serve him and worship him and pursue him and keep him at the center of our lives, the center of our hearts. And so we saw how good and wonderful God was in the story of creation. And then we saw how our own sin broke that plan and messed everything up. And we see how sin quickly spirals out of control. And then we looked really and got to a point last week where we were looking at the story about the, the Tower of Babel. Before that, we saw God's grace and mercy in the midst of our sin. Despite our sin, God is still filled with grace and mercy and offers us more chances. And yet the people of Babel were building a tower. They were building for their own glory rather than building for God's glory. They're building their kingdom rather than building God's kingdom. And so today, as we move into Genesis chapter 12, we are going to see a contrast from Genesis chapter 11. We're going to see that, that Abraham is, is getting some things right that the people of Babel messed up on. Now, we're going to be talking about Abraham, and you may have noticed in the scripture, or may, you may have paid attention to this before, that you'll see that he is called Abram in the story. Abram will get his name changed to Abraham. It is the same person. I'm probably going to call him Abraham because, you know, Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. <laughs> now, if you grew up in church, you might understand that's a song that we used to sing. And, and if you didn't, then you're like, I don't, I don't, I don't get that poem. Um, but that's okay. Uh, Abraham is, is, is critical to the understanding of, 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 of God's story, of our story, uh, of looking at who God is and how he uses his people and who his people are and our relationship to God. Um, Abraham is really probably on like the Mount Rushmore of Jewish history. I mean, you're talking about Abraham and Moses and maybe David as the representation of the kings and Elijah as the representation of the prophets. Like these four are kind of on a higher level than everyone else. And so his story would have been significant as Moses is writing to tell Israel about who they are and reminding them that they are God's people and reminding them how to live as God's people. And so it's important to us as well. As a matter of fact, there's 14 chapters that cover the life of Abraham. That's a lot of scripture for one person. So uh, we clearly should take notice of his story. And today we're going to dive into the very beginnings of his call and his journey and his relationship with God. So Genesis chapter 12, verse one. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So we start immediately with focus again on God. Remember, this is God's story. It's not Abraham's story, right? It's not first and foremost our story. It is first and foremost God's story. It's about him, and we need to see him through the pages of Scripture, including in the story of Abraham. And so God calls Abraham, and he says, you're going to leave something, and you're going to go somewhere. You're going to leave that which is familiar and that which is comfortable, and you're going to go to a place that is unknown where I will lead you there. And so we look and we see that he says, go from your country, your people, and your father's household. So he starts with a very wide view of what he's leaving, and he begins to narrow it to show him that you are leaving everything that's familiar. You're leaving your country, which is your culture, your nationality, like how you identify yourself, one of the first identifiers you have. You're leaving your community, your people, right? You're leaving those who you would go and watch sports games with, those who you work with, your friends, your neighbors. You're leaving all that behind, and you're leaving your father's household the true first identifier that we really have, right? You're, you're leaving this, this family, and although that is a pretty common thing for people to, uh, you know, uh, get a adult age and, and leave and go different places, that was not common in Abraham's time. What he's being asked to do is something different. It's something strange. It's something out of the ordinary. But he's being called to leave everything that is familiar to him. And it's not just what is familiar, but it's also what is comfortable, He's leaving Haran, which is in this place, Ur of the Chaldeans. And Ur of the Chaldeans was an ancient city, but it was a very advanced city. They had stone houses, good for protecting them against the elements, 
protecting them against anything that might try and do them harm. They were sturdy and secure. They had running water, both hot and cold, right? They're bougie, okay? (laughs) They're living the life here. They're educated people. This was an advanced city in this time, an advanced place in this time. And Abraham is being asked to leave. And where is he going? Not to a place that's familiar. No, go, go where I'll lead you to go. I'm not even going to tell you where. God, you want me to go? Okay, where are we going? Like, let me, let me pull it up on my map. Let me pull it up on my GPS. Nope. Just get in the car, start going, right? Well, you don't even have a car. Just start walking. I'll show you the way. I'll show you the place. I'll tell you when you're there. And by the way, the comforts that you have currently at home, you're not going to experience that. No, Hebrews 11 would tell us that Abraham would spend the rest of his life living in a tent. So he goes from advanced city to permanent camper. I'm not signing up for that. Like, I know there are some campers in the room that, like, this would be their dream. They're like, yes, if I could sell all my possessions and just permanently camp, like, that's what I'm in for. But I'm going for the VRBO with a hot tub or maybe a hotel with room service, right? Right? And he had these things and he's leaving it behind because God has called him to leave it. So here's what I want to understand. While the call is hard, it's also valuable. God calls his people. What an amazing blessing that is. God calls his people. Just think about that for a moment. That he chooses us to be in relationship with him. He chooses us to be a part of his plans and his purpose. God has called us to him He's called us to the life that he has in store for us. He's called us to obedience with him. He's called us to love him and to love others. Like the fact that God chooses to use sinful, broken, flawed people like you and I is an incredible gift from him. And Abraham, we, we can often look back and, and we, we know some of his, his weaknesses, we know some of his failures, but I want to understand that oftentimes we're going we're gonna to hold Abraham up because it, there's moments of faith that are really good. There's some things that we can look at and say, okay, this is how we should live in response to God, the way Abraham lived in response to God. But, but I want to understand at, at the beginning here, Abraham's a nobody. Like he, he's not like the king of some nation. He's not necessarily a super holy person. He's living in a place where their primary worship was pagan worship. They're worshiping false gods. So most likely, that's, who he, that's what he was doing. He was probably living as the culture lived. And yet God says, Abraham, I'm choosing you. I'm calling you to myself. I'm calling you to a new life. I'm calling you to be something bigger than you could have ever been by yourself. God calls his people and he's called you and I to relationship with him, to obedience to him, to serving him, to being a part of what he has in store for us, to be a part of what he's doing in this world. What an amazing blessing that is. And here's the thing. For some of us, we look and we say, well, okay, Abraham left everything that was comfortable, everything that was familiar, and he's going to a place where he doesn't get to see where it is. He doesn't know what the journey has in store for him. That's really hard. That's really challenging. I don't, I don't know if I could do that all the time. And maybe some of you feel the same way. Maybe some of you look and you're like, I don't know that my faith would lead me to take that step. I don't know that I could leave behind that which is right in front of me, that which I'm experiencing, that which I'm living in right now, which is familiar and comfortable. I I don't know if I can leave that just on the, the hope that God has something better in store. And maybe the problem for us, if we're not willing to take that step of faith, maybe the problem is, is that we don't know who God is or we don't know his promises for us. See, Abraham's asked to do something very challenging and God immediately says, by the way, I'm gonna do the way harder work for you. It's gonna be about me. And I have all these great promises for you. So he says in verses two and three, he says, God saying to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. See, now that's something I might be able to sign up for. All right, you're going to be great. You're going to be a great nation. Your name is going to be great. And by the way, anyone who curses you, anyone who's mean to you, I'm going to take care of them. All right, I can do that. So Abraham, he hears the call. He also hears the promise of God. 
And what's interesting is that this is a really a, a contrast moment to the story of the Tower of Babel, which is one chapter earlier, right? You got Genesis 11. The people are doing what? They're trying to make a name for themselves. They're trying to make themselves into a great nation. And God says, no, 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 you can't do that. And so he scatters them. Genesis chapter 12, God says, Abraham, you're going to be a great nation. Your name is going to be great. And you got to be thinking if you're Abraham and you read Genesis chapter 11, which he wouldn't because it wasn't written at that time. But like if you know the story, th- that you're thinking, wait, wait, this is, this is a test, right? Like I'm not supposed to be great. My name's not supposed to be great. That was, that was how the other people messed up. So I'm not going to do that. Well, no, this is, this is exactly what the problem in Babel was, is that they were trying to do for themselves the work that only God can do and the work that God is willing to do. They were trying to build their way up to God, and God's like, hey, I'm the one who comes down to you. I lift you up. You don't lift yourself up to me. I come down to you, and I will lift you up if I so choose. And so here he's telling Abraham, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to do the work, but it's going to happen my way. And so we should see this contrast from Genesis 11 when the people tried to make themselves great, do the work themselves, versus Genesis 12 when Abraham is just trusting God. And God makes it very clear who the one who's doing the work is, right? He says, I will make you great. I will, I will, I will, I will. It's not about you, Abraham. It's not about us, church. It's about God. Any great thing that we accomplish, any great thing that we do is because of and for him. If we try and do it on our own, our plans are going to be flawed. They're going to be scattered. They're going to be put to shame. But when we trust God and trust his promises, ah, that's when we get the good stuff. See, we need to understand that God's ways are better than ours. Now, if you're taking notes, write down God's ways are better than mine. Don't write down God's ways are better than Ryan's. That's true. But make it personal for yourself. I mean, you can write ours if you want, but I think it's important to make it personal and say God's ways are better than mine. God's ways are better than yours. God's ways are better than anyone's. See, when we try and do things on our own, on our way, it's always going to come up short. But when we trust God's plan, then maybe, just maybe, he'll make us into a great people. We don't have to worry about our name being great because if God chooses to make our name great, then fantastic. But if he doesn't, we still get to be in relationship with him and that's all we should need. We still get to serve him and that's all we should be about. We humble ourselves knowing that God is bigger, that he's always going to have to be the one to come down. And if he chooses to lift us up, great. But we need to trust his ways over our ways. And so sometimes that's reading scripture and that's going to challenge us. There's sometimes there's going to be a sin problem that we have that we've been holding on to and we're going to be challenged to give that up. I say, man, I want to keep holding on to that, but God, I know it's time to release it. Sometimes it's going to be like Abraham where it's a step of faith where we can't see the end result. We can't see what's in front of us. Maybe we see some, some struggles, but we trust him. See, what we can't get confused, we need to make sure that we remember God's ways being the best way does not mean it's the easiest way. Abraham's life was not an easy life. He was leaving a place that was easy, but it was going to be the best. As a matter of fact, down in verse 10, we're not even going to read that, but it says when he got to the place where God led him to go, you know what was waiting there for him? A famine. Like if you're Abraham, aren't you a little bit frustrated with that? You know, God, I left all this stuff behind. I followed you. Like I thought maybe there'd be a buffet spread out, right? Like something good to come into. But instead he enters the land, there's a famine. But I guarantee you at the end of Abraham's life, he didn't look back and say, man, I wish I'd stayed. I wish I'd stayed in my stone house with running water. No, because he saw God's faithfulness over and over and over and over again. He saw God be faithful to his promises, fulfill his promises in a way that only he could. And he blessed Abraham in a way that Abraham couldn't even dream of on his own. And so when we look at Abraham's story and we see the beginning, we we know that hardship is projected out, but we know that God will be faithful to his promises. And so we trust his ways are better than ours. Now God does all the heavy lifting, but there is a step that we need to take. 
And it says in verse four, so Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Those first three words of, of verse four, so Abram went. See, Abram did what God asked him to do. And so when God extends the call, when God extends the invitation, we take that step of obedience. We take that step of faith. We respond to God in faith. This is what Abraham did, and this is what we need to do as well. Now in Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It tells us that we may not see the end result, but we trust God's plan and we follow what he asks us to do. We go where he calls us to be. We trust him. And this is what Abraham did. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, a little bit later, down in verse eight, it will tell us this. It says, by faith, Abraham when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. See, Abraham was keeping his eyes focused on the king. He was keeping his eyes focused on the Lord. He was keeping his eyes focused on the one true God, the one who he knew his life was about, who everything was about. And what Abraham did that was really spectacular is he trusted God. He took God at his word. He said, God, if this is what you say, then it's true. See, Abraham did what Adam and Eve failed to do. Adam and Eve were given a promise. They were given a, a purpose. They were given a plan by God. And the serpent came and asked them one question. Did God really say? And so for Adam and Eve, they begin to question God's word. They begin to question his character, his goodness, his faithfulness. And because they failed to trust God at his word, they entered into sin. They entered into disobedience. But Abraham trusted God. He said, God, if this is what you say, then this is what is true. Now, I'll let you know a little something about later on in the story. Abraham doesn't always get this right. Comes a time where he really messes up. He's not perfect. But in God's grace, he continues to give us second chances or third chances or fourth chances or however many chances we need. And he continues to point us back on the path that leads to life. But we need to be willing and able to accept God at his word. To say, God, if you say it, then you will do it. If you say it, it is truth. If this is what you call me to, then this is how I'm going to respond. Because I believe your promises. I'll take you at your word. We respond to God in faith. And that's what Abraham did through his whole journey. As a matter of fact, look at these next few verses. It says, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Now, pause. This is important. Abraham is entering the land of the Canaanites. The nation of Israel is about to enter the land of the Canaanites. Yes, thank you to the three people who participated. <laughs> it's okay, we don't normally do that, so I understand. They're about to enter the land of the Canaanites. So when they see the word Canaanites and they see Abraham entering this land, the promised land, but they see the opposition is going to be the same, their ears are going to start to tune in. They're going to say, wait, what happened? Because we're going into this land of opposition, and so did our father Abraham. And it says this, in the land of the Canaanites, the Lord appeared to Abram. God showed up in the place of battle, in the place of opposition. And he said, to your offspring, I will give this land. God made a promise to him there saying, I will take care of you. I will provide for you. I will do what I've already told you I was going to do. So Abraham, so he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. 
From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel in the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. And so Abram enters the land and God shows up and God reaffirms his promise to Abraham and Abraham worships God. Worship enters the land. It enters opposition land. It enters this place of battle. And God shows up and says, I got this. Trust me. Trust my promise. Trust my faithfulness. Trust my goodness. Trust my power. Trust my strength. Don't trust your own. Trust me. I am the one leading the way. I'm the one who's promised this to you. And I'm the one who's going to do the work and be faithful to you. And so while Abraham is receiving this promise, years later, the Israelites would be reading this and would be saying, yeah, that's right. God is faithful. He fulfilled his promise to our father Abraham, and he's going to fulfill his promise to us today. And when we read this now, thousands of years later, we read this promise to say God was faithful, and God will be faithful to us today. And it's not just this story, but I mean, you read all through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, we see that God is victorious in places where opposition reigns, God is king and his kingdom will not be stopped. And we know that we're in a place of spiritual battle, of spiritual opposition. We're in a post-Christian culture here in the United States of America, a culture that continues to move further away from God. But you know what? God is still going to be victorious because he always has been. And as we sing in one of my favorite songs sometimes, if God has been faithful then, why would he stop now? He won't. He's going to continue to be faithful. And so we read the way Abraham moved in faith and we see the way God provided, the way God protected, the way God took care of him. And we know that that is true for us as well. That when things are hard, when things are difficult, when things are challenging, we just put our eyes firmly on him and say, God, I can't see the end. And man, I wish I could sometimes. Man, I wish I, I, I knew how you were gonna get me over this hill, but I trust that you're gonna do it. Man, I wish you, I knew how you were going to remove this barrier, but I trust that you were going to do it. Man, I wish I understood how the pain and the grief that I'm, I'm facing right now, how that's going to glorify you. And I don't understand that now. I wish I did, but I trust that you are faithful through it. Because we've seen that you've been faithful over and over and over and over and over and over again. And so we have no reason to question your faithfulness now. See, God was faithful to Abraham and he chose him for an amazing purpose, but he didn't just choose him to just bless Abraham. No, he blessed Abraham to be a blessing. He chose Abraham to be a blessing to others. He called Abraham to be a blessing and he calls us to the same thing. See, we are chosen, called by God to be a blessing to others. We are chosen to be a blessing to others. God didn't just give you faith so that you could hold on to it yourself. And say, look how great I am. God chose me. No, he gave you faith so that you could share that with all the world. So that you could be a light in the darkness. So that we could be pastors in our areas of influence. And so we need to leave this place today and every week. And go into our world. Go into the mission field. Which is our homes, our places of work, our schools, our communities, our neighborhoods. And we need to do what God has called us to do, to be a blessing to others by showing them the love, acceptance, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, by boldly speaking truth and proclaiming Jesus to this world. And so here's the thing, as the people of God, that's who we are. And I want to issue a challenge to us as this local congregation of the people of God, as this local gathering of the people of God here in Carmichael. Christ Community Church, we don't just read about faith. We live faith. And so I have a challenge for us this week that we would take one of three steps or all three steps this week. And the first is this, listen to God. Listen to God. Maybe you really are struggling to live the life that God has for you because you don't know him. You don't know his character. You don't know his nature. You don't know his promises for you. You don't know what he has in store for you. You don't know what he wants from you. Open up your word and listen to God. Listen to his voice. Spend time in prayer. But don't just talk the whole time. Actually pause and listen. 
Ask God to reveal his, his purpose, his plans to you. Spend time in community so that we can help interpret the Bible together. Spend time being discipled to hear from someone you trust who knows God and may know, help, help you see God's plan for your life. Listen to God. The second thing is live the life that God has for you. See, some of us, we get really good at studying the Bible. We get really good at memorizing God's word and we're really bad at actually doing anything about it. Some of us, we know God's laws, we know his commands, but we still live in sin because it's comfortable, it's familiar. It's what we've always done. Some of us, we know that God is leading us to something bigger than ourselves, that he has a plan for us, a purpose for us, a mission for us, but we don't want to do it because it's too hard. We don't see how it's going to work out. Live the life that God has for you. Do what he's called you to do. And third and finally, something I think that most of the room needs to hear, because I think most of the room has taken those first two steps, Love someone the way that God has called you to do. Love someone the way that God has loved you. And see, this is my challenge to myself because so often I, I take working at a church for granted. I take the fact that people will show up and I get to proclaim the word on a weekly basis for granted. And I think, well, I've done my share on Sunday, so I don't need to do anything Monday through Saturday. But that's not truth. Not for me and not for any of you as well. See, God has placed us in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our, 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 our areas of influence for a reason. He says, I want you to go and love some people. Maybe it's just taking the first step and saying, hey, who can I serve this week? Who can I serve and demonstrate Jesus to them? Maybe there's some people I have a relationship with, and, and, and I'm just going to put an invite out to invite them to church. You can invite them to Easter Sunday. We only got a few more weeks before that. Or you can invite them to next Sunday and say, hey, we're doing this whole thing leading up to Easter. We'd love for you to come and join us. When's the last time you invited someone to come to church with you? Or maybe it's taking that, that third step and saying, you know what? I need to share the gospel with somebody. There's some people in my life that I need to share Jesus with that, that don't know who Jesus is. And I've been too afraid or too busy or too whatever to share it with them. Maybe this week is the week you do it. Listen, I'm issuing this challenge for myself as well as for you. But here's what I would love. I would love it if every person in this church took one of those three steps. I would love it if every follower of Christ really went out and invited someone or, or shared Christ with someone or served someone this week. And I would love to hear some of those stories and maybe even share some of those stories next week. So my email should be in the bulletin. It's ryan at cccnow.com. And if you take one of these steps this week, whether it goes well or poorly, or it's just like, I think I did the thing. I'm not really sure because nothing seemed to happen. Like, praise God that you took the step. Let's celebrate that together. Send me an email. Let me know how it went. Again, some of us may be yelled at. We'll celebrate that. Praise God. Maybe that was a seed being planted. Some of us, we're going to maybe lead someone to Christ this week. Praise God. How amazing that we get to be a part of that. But church, let's be the people of God in action. Do what God has called us to do. We are chosen to be a blessing to others. So let's actually live that out. Now, here in the, the final week of this series in the beginning, as we wrap up talking about being God's people, what a perfect way to end the service than to come together in communion, to gather at the Lord's table, to be reminded that it is God who does the work, that he is the one who is glorified, that his name is great, that we are his people. And our story is not about us, but it's about him. And so we celebrate in what Christ did for us. And on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the elements, he took the bread, and he said, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup. He said, this is the blood of the, the, the new covenant, the new promise that I am making to you. It is the forgiveness of sins that Christ's blood would wash away our sins, cleansing us from our sins so that we can stand right and whole before God. And in doing that, God brings us to himself. And we come in, in his presence and celebrate that we get to be present with God today. But he also invites us to invite others into that presence as well. That we are blessed to be a blessing. We experience God's presence here and now so that we can go and demonstrate it and share it out there the rest of the week. 
And so as we come to, together in communion, we come and, and receive the elements. Let's remember what God has done for us and remember what he has called us to do, to join him in what he's doing in our world. And let's give him thanks for the work that he has already accomplished. So communion is a time for those who call themselves believers. It is a time for those who are right with the Lord. And actually it says in, in scripture that we need to make sure that we are right with one another, that if we have issues with one another, we need to take care of that before we approach the table. And so let's come with proper hearts and minds dedicated and focused on him. As you come, if you exit your, uh, if you exit your seats and exit to your left, and then you can enter back on your right-hand side. That's going to help keep the flow of traffic moving so we don't all just run into each other while we're trying to receive communion. So let me pray for us, and we'll receive the elements together. Oh, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this time that we have together. We give you thanks for our church. We give you thanks for your word, for the truth of the gospel message. God, we give you thanks that you did the work that we can't possibly do on our own, that you paid the price for our sins that we never could, that your blood has cleansed us, that your body took the place that we deserved so that we could have life through you instead. So God, as we receive that, as you call us to your presence, would we also remember that we are called to be a blessing to others? that we receive from you and freely give out that which you have given to us, that our lives are a reflection of you and your love and your grace and your truth, that your name would be made great through our lives. God, we thank you for who you are and for inviting us into your family to be a part of your people. We thank you for this time that we have with you, receiving the elements. We love you, Father, and praise things in your son's name. Amen.